Hi folks, how are you doing today? I hope I find you well on this Monday morning. I have no idea what the weather's like. I'm recording this on Friday because if I don't start recording now, his lordship inside will probably figure a way of stopping me. I can already hear him make a noise. This may cut in and out occasionally. This could be a good thing because you don't really want to hear him in action, do you? Well, we'll see. Anyway, this is the first of two videos this week. I'm go going to do a uh, this uh, video on the Monday. I'll post the second one later on the Monday so you can watch them both sequentially. You can binge watch me because you really want to do that when you're locked in is watch some pasty faced Irish guy ramble on about modernist theatre. But if you do want to binge watch me, you know where to get me. As always, there's a couple of little things to uh, look for in this uh, in this particular video. Uh, how many do I have? I have two uh, to crop up hidden in the middle somewhere. The things that I will be telling you to uh, send me this in an email. So that'll let me know that you've watched the thing and I'll throw in a bonus point as well for the crack. Um, how are you doing? Are you all right? I hope you are all right, because this is tough. I do appreciate that this is tough. Uh, and this is not the ideal way to be doing this kind of thing anyway. Um, as I said, or as I promised, there should be, a, uh, an, in your email that has this link, there should be something telling you about how the class is going to run from here on in. We're looking at uh, a couple of classes this week, a couple of classes next week. Uh, video this week mostly. I think it's video and non-video next week on the Zoom thing. And then the weeks after it's going to be mostly Zoom and work your work on your own uh, because what we're going to do is we're going to do monologues for instead of a final group project. So the grade is going to be split in two, partly for writing, partly for performing your monologues. Uh, again, if you've got better ideas, please do pepper me with them. Uh, but that's what the aim is from here on is we're going to get the focus on you performing and producing and as I've always said with these classes my goal is to turn you not to turn you to help explore and if needs be develop you as leaders as public speakers as people who are going to be leading the line for your colleagues your community your country in the future and monologues makes a lot of sense in that regard. Anyway, any questions before I begin? Doesn't matter because you can't catch me. However, you can get me by sending emails. Please email me with any questions. I know I'm not perfect at getting back, but you'll have them back in a day, a day and a half. And also the other thing I do want to get you to do at the moment is uh, be aware that every Wednesday, whether it's a, as part of a class or not, I will be doing a Zoom thing uh, between, oh, what are the hours? Between 10.30 and 12. And if you come in at like 11.59 and catch me, I will stay on and talk to you however long you need. But between 10.30 and 12 on Wednesdays, even this week when there's in theory a video, uh, please feel free to pop in and chat and ask me questions and question my answers and whatever you need to do. Uh, we're all trying to help in whatever way we can. This is a far from ideal circumstance. None of us want you to be having to sit at home to watch this. Although, in fairness, which of you have put on full clothes to watch this? Because you really didn't need to. I don't know. You have no idea what I'm wearing beneath my crop top shirt. Anyway, into actual class mode now might be an idea because, uh, yeah, we're here to learn. Again, this is going to be in around an hour, not much over, not much under, all going well, and we'll be able to have um, time to think and reflect. Uh, I'll also link in a few videos that maybe might be worth watching. Again, I'm not going to be checking you up on these. I just think if you find this interesting, you might find some of the videos I add in interesting too. Now, to begin, let's uh, what we're doing this week is we're talking about modern theatre. Now, I can't speak for you. Growing up where I did and when I did, we thought we lived in modern times. 
Modern was what we called everything that was, you know, uh, new. Um, when, oh wow, we're going back a bit for you, I suppose. When the Commodore 64 was a thing and there was a kid in my school who had one, we talked about how amazing it was to live in a time when we could have modern things such as computers. In a very real sense, modern describes a specific time and a specific movement, particularly when we're talking about the arts and, and talking about theatre. We no longer live in modern times. We live as we have always lived in contemporary times. As we look back, we may talk about this as being the digital age or the information age or the plague age, which would be a bit foolish because we've had plague for all bar maybe 80 years of our history. Plague has been a regular thing. Um, and just a reminder, did you wash your hands before coming up to this computer? Because I won't, I won't talk to you if you didn't wash your hands. Um, the modern age really kind of describes a period that at its, at its most appropriate, the 1830s roughly, through to World War II. That would describe uh, the modern age. You could pull it back to maybe 1800s, but the 1830s through to World War II uh, kind of covers the modern age. It's a time when there was a lot of change. You could argue that the industrial age covers a lot of it too, and it does to a degree. But this change is brought about by the byproducts, if you will, of the industrial age. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to kick the table. Put my feet up, because you know I'm at home, I want to take it easy. The modern age is how we end up changing our way of life and our way of understanding based on the byproducts of the industrial age. The industrial age brought us mass produced stuff for the first time. It brought us um, a change in where we lived. We had lived predominantly in rural areas outside of the major cities, maybe in towns, but generally outside that. For an example, you know, Ireland, uh, as we were, before we became an industrial society, uh, Ireland of the 1930s was 70% living in an agricultural setting or in uh, an agricultural related business. And that would have been greater throughout the world um, by, by the arrival of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution changed things, it put people living together and it created the uh, advent of modern consumerist culture uh, or modern consumerist capitalism as well as modern corporate capitalism or contemporary corporate of many. Previously, you got your clothes from what your father used to wear or your mother used to wear, and maybe you got you uh, you sewed your own, you repaired. Things didn't change much for hundreds of years. There was a bit of a kerfuffle about what religion you were following for a while in the in the European sense. There was the discovery of new worlds, uh, so, so to speak, from a European sense, and you know, obviously, the advent of slavery. There was 200 years when nothing much really changed. Industrialization changed a lot of things, changed the nature of commerce. It changed in the United States. It changed the industrial focus or the commercial focus from the South, which was a slave run economy to the North, where it was a people treated one step or two steps better than slaves if they weren't rich. But, um, yeah, it, it really refocused how we did things. As a result of it, we had industrialization of military and then industrialization of medicine. Science became a more big and more, a more significant and a more daily occurrence. It wasn't some guy sitting in a garden thinking, oh, I wonder why that apple fell. It was, we need to make this thing better and faster than the other people, therefore, we need to figure out the science of how to do this better. This development of science led to a change in so many different things. When it comes to art, the main, the biggest change initially was the advent of the photograph. Now, uh, I'm gonna jump in to a PowerPoint. Yep, it's a PowerPoint class, but it's on a video, so is it better, is it worse, who knows? So, in many senses, this was the world 
uh, of art prior to the photograph. This was attempt to somewhat realistically recreate uh, both feelings as well as experiences. You can see our friend here, this lady, she's very realistically painted. You can imagine her looking somewhat like this. Can this hold a candle to a photograph? Not even slightly. This, at best, is a very good imitation. It's believable. We have the shadow, but it has a hyper-realistic sense and it isn't as apt as a photo. This imaginative and we would call it pic picaresque or picturesque image is a fantasy based on a reality. It looks realistic. It feels realistic. There was a movement in art in the 17th through 19th centuries of artists going to some place like Italy, painting a dozen pictures, coming back and selling them and saying, oh, this is Italy. And oh, we'll never travel to Italy. This looks wonderful. Oh, that's what Italy looks like. In reality, no, this is the front bit is Italy. The back is fanciful and invented, possibly. A photograph cuts through that. It captures much of the beauty, but it makes this realistic work somewhat redundant. Now, I say this, but I also want it to be known that this kind of work continues to be made and will continue to be made for centuries going forward. The movement had been towards making things more and more accurate, more photo accurate, if you will, as we went along. Whereas when the photograph comes along, this becomes somewhat redundant. But people will still do this. And this is true of all arts. Arts that were triumphant, we will say, in the 14th century are still being practiced. More, maybe we like to think of it as being more sophisticated. No, it's just really evolved in a direction. When the photograph came, this art was redundant. So people who wanted to excel needed to find some way of competing with the photograph. Much as today, theater needs to find a way of competing with Netflix. How these problems are solved varies from person to person, but they try different things. We have expressionists and impressionists. The, exp the impressionist is the uh, Monet, I think it's Monet, on the, in the uh, left-hand side. The expressionist is Van Gogh in the, on the right-hand side. These have different kind of things. If you look at the impressionist version, the windmill, uh, from a distance, it looks fairly realistic. It looks almost like we might remember an image from our youth. It looks to some degree as we would expect our imaginings to be. From a distance, from 10 feet back, it looks very realistic. As you go closer and closer, if you go right into the image, you'll see, apart from the pixelation, sorry, you know, it's a computer, but you'll see that the, you will see the lines drawn. You will see the texture of the paint if you actually get to see it up close. You can tell that this isn't real. If you take, if you looked at the, say, top, uh, bottom left corner of that image and looked at it up close, you would see merely lines that do not make any sense. But when you pull back, you can see it in a better sense. This was, if you like, a, ca a contradiction, uh, a counter to the photorealism. We're going to try and create the image by not painting the image as we see, uh, as it is, but building and layering up an idea of what it feels like. Similarly so with the expressionist, except rather than trying to capture the precise picture, it is an attempt to capture the feeling. That one's called Starry Night. You may have come across it before. This fella we know can do fairly realistic looking pictures. Most of the people who practice Impressionism, Expressionism, and many of the other art forms start by learning how to draw an apple really well. Still life. Still life classes is the foundation of learning to become an artist. It is learning the craft. I always make the distinction between craft and art. Craft is this, the ability, the skill to do the thing. Art is having something to say with it. And this speaks of the feeling of how a starry night is. It's not realistic. And if you take a photograph of something, it's a very realistic impression of that moment, 
but it loses all the flavor. You don't get the sense of the wind blowing. You don't get the, the ability to sort of stare into one portion of that image and just make it feel like you're right inside of it. A picture is something you can hold at an arm's length. An exp a good expressionistic image is something that, cons uh, that you fit into. And that, I thought, was the big uh, movement, or the big um, bonus of the expressionist movement, was you feel it. And that is true, too, of the impressionists. As we go along, and photorealism is easier and quicker, people decide, I want to say something different. I want to draw upon the past and use the skills there to speak of something new. In the past, for example, in these realistic pictures, the cleverer painters, the more ingenious painters, would fit something in. For example, you'd see a picture of a, ma of a man sitting on a horse, and if the horse's legs were uh, raised, he died in battle, and if the, if the horse was on all fours, he died in, uh, during life. That's true of the statues. In the uh, case of uh, paintings, you would see maybe a woman is holding a specific flower. It's a realistic depiction of that uh, specific flower, but what that specific flower was connotated something. It was a suggestion of rue, that means death. Uh, lavender, that means perhaps something else. The different images within that picture, which may seem like background decoration filling the canvas, had something to say. With the Surrealists, they tried to do the same thing as well. Looking on the left, this is a paint these are both two paintings by René Magritte, who is my favourite of the Surrealists, and also he has a song written about him by Paul Simon. If you're old and crotchety like me, that means something. Here on the left, we have a picture of a man. We uh, Ordinarily, we look at it, some guy with an apple in front of his face. What do these things mean? It's not a real, it's a realistic in one sense, but it's a non-realistic setting. What does all this mean? Uh, he's wearing a bowler hat, he's wearing a suit, he's got a white shirt on, and it looks like, is he wearing gloves? The skin tone is very different, if that's a skin tone, so I suspect he's wearing gloves. He's got a red tie on. The red tie doesn't, doesn't keep, seem in keeping with the monochromatic nature of everything, nor do the, red, uh, the reddish looking gloves. The bowler hat was fairly standard. This is an ordinary looking guy, but he's a, got a very lurid, bright tie on. That says something. He's standing in front of a wall and behind him there is an endless sea, an, infin an infiniteness. But it's overcast, it's cloudy, it doesn't look like particularly good times, but it doesn't look like particularly bad times. It looks kind of like particularly bland times. His back is to the sea. What does that suggest? His, he is turning his, what does the sea mean to you? Now you're going to take different things. Back in the day, if you go to the Greeks, the sea meant possibility, it meant hope, it meant the future, but it could also mean death. Because for the Greeks, a seafaring people, that was where their livelihood and life came from. It also was the possibility of exploring. In the early 20th century, what does it mean? What is he turning his back on? Is he standing out from the crowd by having a red tie? Or if you squint your eyes slightly, that red tie becomes almost a black or a gray again. He's very formally dressed. What does that say? And this apple in front of his face. Now, this is a good Christian college. The apple represents a number of things. It represents life and birth. But also, it was the apple that led us out of Eden. What does this apple represent? Is he... Uh, is original sin, so to speak, staring him in the face, and he is more his sin than he is himself. Is it life is, uh, he has put life between him and us, as in life is on all around him, but he is not part of it. We can spend a lot of time looking and inquiring about this. I'll mention uh, Maeterlinck was a great, Be uh, Magritte was a uh, Belgian writer, as was Maeterlinck, and Maeterlinck was one of the key writers of uh, the Surrealist movement. Most of these art movements have their theatrical, or sorry, most of these visual arts movements have their theatrical uh, 
paramour, if you like, their uh, match. <clears throat> Ceci n'est pas un pipe. This is not a pipe. That is what those words mean. And you look at this image, you think, is that a fair caption? This is not a pipe? Well, it is a pipe, isn't it? You know, it's a, a smoking pipe, except it doesn't really, it's not a photorealistic smoking pipe. It's, it's like one, but it isn't. But, you know, what is a pipe? Is a pipe uh, something that water runs through going down uh, into the mains? That's a pipe. Uh, or are we looking at it simply from the fact of this is not a pipe, this is an image of a pipe. You can see the importance of meaning and purpose behind what these artworks are. Again, similar to the uh, Reformation movement in religion, in Christianity, in the 17th, uh, sorry, the 16th and 17th centuries, this is a Reformation movement in art in the 19th and 20th centuries. It is requiring us or requesting us to interpret for ourselves. Now, that, like with the Christian uh, Reform, the Christian Reformation, the Art Reformation has not prevented hundreds of thousands of people making a big living out of telling the world, yeah, now the whole deal is we now interpret for ourselves, so I'll interpret for you, which I kind of just did. Dadaists, these guys are fun because they don't care. Um, what is art is their big question. Is this art or why is this not art? A friend of mine recently posted up a picture, which I might post up here now if I think of it, um, a picture of a spigot in U of L. And by that spigot, or just over that spigot, there is posted a, pic, uh, a little printed out piece of paper that says, this is art. Dadaists are roaming Louisville wild. There is probably a bounty on them. So if you shoot one, uh, you may be able to be eligible for $20. I'm going to disavow that comment now because you probably aren't. But I mean, I like dadaists, so. Let, let them roam free. Dadaists took the attitude of, is this art? So this piece on the left, um, this is basically a picture of a urinal. The piece is called Fountain. Now, if you conjure the idea of what a fountain is and set it alongside the idea of what this does, you get a pretty uh, rich image. It was made by Marcel Duchamp and it was made in 1917. Basically, he took an existing uh, urinal or pissoir, as they were known at the time, and he scribbled the name or mut on it because the manufacturer was Motley and Company or something like that. He changed Mott to Mutt because of the Mutt and Jeff cartoons that were in the newspapers at the time and rounded it off by uh, giving him the first name of Richard. Richard is basically the French slang for money bags. He thought it was funny that a urinal would basically be supposedly rich. At any rate, uh, this piece was presented to a, an organization who made a promise that they would, dis uh, they would exhibit any piece of work that was uh, submitted with the full money given in. So he was making something of a comment about the moneyed nature of exhibitions, which kind of Exu uh, keeps out of uh, the space those who are not rich enough to do so. But yeah, it was not something he made. That's not his name. And further to the point, it is cocking a snook, uh, to use a very old phrase, at the arts establishment that maintains that it is oh so important is essentially pilloried here uh, in this satirical piece. Is that art? Or is that chanting your arm? On the right hand side, you've got the Mona Lisa, as sung famously by Nat King Cole. Beautiful song, but if you haven't heard it, you should listen to it. It's really good. Uh, expose yourselves to all kinds of art. But this Mona Lisa is subtly different. Somebody has drawn a moustache and a soul patch on. 
is this Mona Lisa defaced? Is this instead a new work, completely new and original, that is using the original work? Arguably, all work is. Again, I go back to my favourite biblical quote. There is nothing new under the sun. So is Shakespeare taking an old play called Amleto and turning it into Hamlet? Is that Dadaism? Is that art? It's better than the original. Is this better than the original? In the modern world, where, where we now are cognizant and engaging with issues of trans identity, is this now speaking to us? For me, my ultimate uh, line with art is, does it speak to us? Does it have something to say to us? Arguably, no. Arguably, yes. Art always will be in the eye of the beholder. The artist will do their best, but no matter what I do, it will be ultimately up to you to decide whether for you it is art or it is not. So that's a good old chunk on the movements in art. And this is a good time to mention that I would like you to, as one of your little uh, treasures to be found, uh, in the next email, hit me with the hashtag, this is not a class. Ceci n'est pas un class, if you like. But this is not a class is one of the things I need you to put in the next email. This should look great on evaluations. Right, so there's a bit of a contrast between theatre and the other art world. Theatre's biggest competitor really is uh, the moving image, uh, cinema. 1896 is the first cinematic presentation, which is the Lumiere Brothers in France showing a train moving. It's colossal, and within uh, 10 years, if I'm not mistaken, Throughout the world, there is filmmaking being made. It's amazing how quickly this technology spreads and how popular it is, really, when you think about it. <clears throat> if you think the mobile phone as we understand it kind of comes into being roughly in about 1987, 1985, somewhere along there, but it really only becomes ubiquitous to the point that they're taking out phone booths by about... 1999, 1998, uh, the year 2000, in and around those years. At that point, the, we live in a much more globalized world, and so the speed of transmission of the idea is surprisingly slow. However, the speed of the transmission of the idea since the mobile phone and since the ubiquity of the internet is remarkable, and that has changed everything. <clears throat> Theatre began a lot of its reforms ahead of and and after the arrival of uh, cinema. Uh, but really, you need to go right the way back. So we remember Shakespeare with the long speeches and everything's written in verse and so on and so forth. Uh, there was, a th in the English-speaking world, things changed. There was a civil war in England, which led to the Puritans taking over, and the Puritans basically banned all fun, which meant they banned all theatre for just under 20 years. At the end of 20 years, when theatre came back, there were a number of difficulties. All the uh, training that had been going on for 40 to 60 years was lost, and they no longer had men who were trained to represent women on stage. They didn't have the apprenticeships going that had been going for years, so they invited women on stage. <clears throat> As the language developed and it became more similar and more familiar to the language we speak today, um, plays changed. There was a lot more comedies. You've just come out of uh, 20 years, sorry, five years of civil war followed by 20 years of repression. You're going to want comedies more than tragedies. And it t tottered along. Uh, similarly so in France as well. The movements, even though they were inspired by different things, we're not dissimilar. <clears throat> and we end up with what we call melodrama. And that gives way into other things. So again, back to the PowerPoint. So, the movement in theatre. Melodrama was what was there when we hit the... Uh, not when we hit the Industrial uh, Revolution. The Industrial Revolution 
brought about melodrama. So in the late 18th century, the 1700s, the late 1700s, about the time of the American Revolution, melodrama was becoming the thing in English theatre. It became a very big thing and it got transported across to the US. I would maintain that a lot of the elements that create melodrama ultimately are down to the likes of Shakespeare. Except the theatre is filled with more ordinary people and there's not, not the same kind of admiration and aspiration to royalty. We're looking, at an or uh, we're looking at things to please the audience as we did in Shakespeare and the characters are often normal people. Now normal people, no they're not normal people, we're looking at people middle classes, there thereabouts. We will have people though who are lower class and, upper, and higher class than that. But sort of ordinary people who uh, aren't landowners but aren't destitute. It was always pitched to entertain, not to educate or explore. Again, that hangover from that 20 years of repression goes long. There's not a, an interest in um, sort of pushing the boundaries of language. There's an interest in pushing the uh, boundaries of the theatre by filling it with people. Generally, it's not in verse because it's being played to normal folks. And scoundrels and villains are the order of the day. We're not talking like people who may be considered bad actors or people who we dislike. We're talking scoundrels, over-the-top villains, guys in capes with twirly moustaches and big black hats, heroes. Uh, the ladies are generally characterised as having very little agency, but they are angelic. You look at, in the, uh, play, the novels of the time, the likes of Trilby and what have you, where there are three, uh, four good, uh, sorry, three good gents, Taffy, Jock, and George, the Englishman, and they're all out to protect poor, saintly, angelic Trilby, a naive uh, but beautiful woman who is so good, so good, she doesn't do anything bad, but she's, uh, she's being ruined and ruled by a scoundrel, a villain called Svengali, who is a foreigner, which is always the worst kind of scoundrel. So they're over the top. You remember me talking about telenovelas when I was talking about Shakespeare? That's what's going on here. We have telenovela type theatre. This gives way, as it must, as at a certain point it's unsatisfactory, it's entertaining, it's fun, but that's only so much. Artists want to push the boundaries. And when you get fed up of, you know, uh, or not able to get to the point where you can make big money, you might want to try doing something different. Realism becomes the big thing. And this is in keeping, if you will, with the arrival of the photograph, trying to make things as realistic as possible. You could argue that this is just aping technology that can do it better. But it was a massive movement for a long time. It, it has been uh, supplanted, but we'll talk about that in a moment. It's about, obviously, making things as realistic as possible. Ordinary people again. Again, we're not looking at the destitute generally in plays, though later on we do do that. Uh, nothing going beyond the daily life. It's, there's not the big kind of like somebody's died or a god has appeared or any of that kind of stuff like you had in Shakespeare. Um, in melodrama, we had a thing where you could have plays like The Streets of New York, which featured a four-story building on the stage on fire every night. Nothing as ordinary as that. This is looking at sort of people going about daily lives. There is a dramatic moment where maybe somebody is in debt or somebody has lost uh, their love or something has gone wrong, but it's not beyond our expectations in the world. Generally, much more familiar to an audience. The ordinary people coming in, they're not looking up to gods and goddesses. They're not looking at kings. They're looking at people who are roughly at their station in life. It can be very much more truthful. Uh, and there's generally no verse. It was very popular at the time. The best example is Antoine Libre's uh, free theatre in uh, Paris, where he it was frequently called uh, Antoine's Back Theatre because Antoine uh, Libre, uh, his big deal uh, was he wanted, actually I've got this wrong, it's not Antoine Libre, it's uh, Antoine's uh, Teatro Libre, it's his free theatre. And it was all, all, often called Antoine's uh, 
back theater because they wanted to dis they wanted to make it as realistic as possible and in a room you will have four four walls and you will not face into a wall when you make your bit when you say something big and important so he would come to the towards the audience and then turn his back on them to talk to the audience or to talk to the rest of the cast different times he would put on plays and because there was a dinner scene in it he would have dinner cooked on the stage so the smells could waft into the audience I've seen people do that with fish. Three-day-old fish is not something you want to be smelling in the audience. But it was a real genuine attempt to make things as realistic as possible. Naturalism was another good one. That was what went on really in many ways to represent theatre and TV as we know it now in the US. It's giving the impression of reality, but it's using theatrical tricks. So we have realistic characters, again, as the other ones, normal people, normal location and normal setting. You know, we're not in the court of the king. We are not on the uh, top of Mount Olympus. We're looking at people's living rooms, people's kitchens, sometimes people's fields. The speech is grander. We're trying to avoid the, uh, hmm, huh, yeah, like, you know, that we have in our ordinary speech. But we're not going to verse. Speeches will go on a little bit longer and they'll speak of, they give a bigger picture about life and try and talk in a, try and talk of the world as a better place than it necessarily is or it aspires to a better thing. And you're definitely going to get some kind of exploration of the human psyche or an imagination or an, uh, a discussion about how we can do better in life. What do we need to do to be our essential selves? Definitely secular. Very few ghosts and gods. Almost none. There's even, there's even a reduction of the mention of Jesus in a lot of the cases. If not careful, it can drift into melodrama. And I've seen plays that in their time were perfectly naturalistic that now feel, if they're performed, they feel like melodrama. The end of one of my favourite plays, The Playboy of the Western World, which is an Irish play, it ends with a woman lamenting the loss of the man who she kind of respected and admired, but he's, grown, he's outgrown the village he's been in. Oh no, I've lost him truly, the only true playboy of the Western world. That I've seen done as, Oh no, I've lost him truly, the only true playboy of the Western world. It's like, no, that's, that's, no, that doesn't work. So part of this desire to go um, in this direction towards more, realism towards more naturalism comes from science uh, the science of psychology is developing and psychoanalysis is developing in the uh, 19th century by the end of the 19th century Freud was everything by the middle of the 20th century we realized that Freud was nothing but sometimes he's a cigar uh, the reality of what was going around in intellectual circles this attempt to understand who we are and what we are is reflected. It's even reflected in melodrama where the attempt to understand the psyche and the interaction and interplay of men and women uh, leads us to some awful mistakes. The whole concept of hysteria and brain fever were very big in melodrama and very important to melodrama. They show up a lot in early naturalism and early realism as well. This idea that, oh, my brain is infected, I'm not a good... Uh, yeah, all that kind of crap. But um, in a real sense, we do have a genuine attempt on the part of the intellectual, the writer, mm. to engage with what's going on. Now, does that always work? Hell no. It really, really uh, doesn't always come across. And you look at some of these plays now, <clears throat> and you're thinking... I will not be trusting that for crowd analysis and what have you. But generally the ones that are more true to who we are, the ones that have maybe not used the psychology of the day, but used observation and recreation have lasted longer. I'm going to look at a couple of the playwrights of the era. And well, yeah, I will ask uh, ahead of this, this is your second task. Which of these guys has the best beard? See, highbrow, highfalutin stuff. Keep an eye carefully on these beards. Uh, but the big question with these is um, not so much 
what is their value, but how is their value still seen today? This is an overview. I did set you to have a look at, uh, try and have a look at a play by either Chekhov or Ibsen, because they'll give you an idea. Um, so bear that in mind as we talk over the next little bit. I term them the founders of modern dramatic writing. Different people fight over who's the true father of the modern theatre and stuff like that. You know, it doesn't matter. It's like Shakespeare. If you like it, great. If not, that doesn't matter. These are people that are looked to by many. Doesn't make them the best. Doesn't make them the worst. Doesn't It just puts them at being in the right place at the right time. Which for some reason seems to be Scandinavia. This is Henrik Ibsen. You can see all around the chops, nothing over the uh, lips. Um, you can see he lived a fair old length of a life. Grew up dirt poor in Norway. Norway was not an actual country at the time. It was part of Sweden. It was a, not colony so much as a possession of Sweden's. Uh, the, not, the language in Norway when he was growing up wasn't even Norwegian. The majority of people spoke Danish. The line for Norwegians that they used to use was, I speak French to my wife, German to my business colleagues, Danish to my friends, and Norwegian to the dog. Very colonized, much like Ireland. Uh, it wasn't a very, he wasn't, he was very unsuccessful for quite a long time. Uh, he eventually ran away from home, so to speak, moved to, uh, moved from Norway to Rome and Germany, and he wrote his biggest plays there. He started off by writing plays in verse because, you know, he's writing in the 1840s, 1850s, that's what people are doing. But eventually he moved on, he graduated, if you like, at the age of about 40 to writing in prose. And he became like the big voice. Wrote about play, plays about people in familiar settings with realistic people. He advocated a lot of social change in his work, particularly interested in the place of the individual in society and treatment thereof. And that, as he had a lot of leading female characters, led a lot of people to call him feminist, which he always refuted, which is like, today that's saying, why would you do that? That's like your cohort. But in many senses, he did not want to be seen as being feminist as opposed to in favour of the uh, emancipation and the equality of all people. Majorly concerned with money in his work, but he grew up poor. He had to leave home at the age of 16 and became an apothecary's apprentice because he didn't have the money to um, in his own household. Um, what I would always say about him, he's famous for plays like A Doll's House, Peer Gint, which is a, a verse one, Ghosts, Hedda Gabler, The Wild Duck, I could go on. I'm a huge, huge fan of this guy. James Joyce, who's a, who I'm also a huge fan of, is a big fan of this guy as well. He's called the father of modern drama. And I mentioned about the danger of, he was very much realist moving into naturalist. His first uh, prose play, which was the uh, League of Youth, is very realist. So it's a little bit flat. By the pillars of society, you can see him developing. And it's really with a doll's house that he becomes very good on the naturalist front, where, where things aspire to more than just what they are. Uh, he With ghosts, I think he goes a little step too far, arguably, where he is a little bit too much uh, about the whole kind of thing of um, naturalism. And it drifts into melodrama very hard. And yes, you get brain fever there, which is a byproduct of syphilis, the uh, big disease of the day. So melodrama is always a danger, and I've seen plenty of productions of his that have been staged like melodrama. One of the problems that Ibsen faces is that people, and this is true of Strindberg and of Chekhov, and all the writers prior to World War II, is that in the post-World War II age, we can either understand comedies that are funny all the way through, or serious tragic things that are dark and serious the whole way through because you know they're important and meaningful and stuff. The reality is his job was to put bums on seats to get people to buy the books that he published his plays as. His job was to ensure that people continued to read and wanted to read and partly that's dealing with controversial topics. Part of it is understanding the basics of how people are and as Milan Kundera says in his work, The Art of the Novel, if you want people to buy into your message, 
you need to make them laugh. If they're laughing, they're listening. If you look at a doll's house, it's generally performed in such ways, Oh dear, oh Torvald, I have great feelings, and these feelings are tragic. The reality is the second act of the play is written as a French farce, which is people running in and out of doors, hiding, and uh, people getting mistaken for identity. It's filled with fun and silliness. She is a very light character until she turns dark. And that's something we forget. He's, Ibsen is regularly ruined by people who are doing it very seriously. Same too with Strindberg. This guy was nuts. Now, interesting, soul patch, big moustache. Kind of the opposite of Ibsen, which is probably appropriate because he and Ibsen detested each other. They continuously moaned and bitched about each other. Uh, Ibsen used to have a, a portrait of this fella hanging over his writing desk, saying he couldn't write a word without the Swedish madman looking at him. This guy also grew up poor, this time in Sweden. So we've moved from, uh, let's say, an outlying arm of the empire to the center of the empire. He was crazy. He was borderline misogynistic, uh, anarchist. He went through lots of phases. This man was big. Uh, if he was around today, he would be doing all the drugs. Uh, he, he drank a lot of absinthe. He wrote about his mental illness uh, in something, a book called The Inferno. He talks about basically be on the, being on the doorstep of madness the whole time. Um, he was always reinventing himself with different kinds of plays. He'd write history plays, and then he'd start writing symbolist plays, and then he'd start writing uh, surrealist plays, all kinds of everything, things from the sea. But not just with art, with uh, theatre. He, he was a painter too, and then he became a photographer. He never settled with anything. That was the interesting thing. And that, his madness, if you will, drove him on. But his yearning to express himself more than anything was the thing that pushed him. In reality, he only wrote plays for maybe six or seven years in total of his life. But he wrote the best part of 60 odd plays, which compared to Ibsen, who was a professional playwright pretty much from the age of, I'm going to say 30 through to him dying uh, at the age of, what was he, 80? He wrote in total maybe 18 plays. This guy wrote 62 in seven years. Some of his more famous plays would be Miss Julie, The Ghost Sonata, and A Dream Play. Miss Julie is a, the, the true expression of naturalism in that uh, it's, and it breaks most of the boundaries for plays in that time. Today, it looks like a fairly, tea, uh, fairly standard 90 minute long play. It talks over itself too many times for many people. But in its day, it was groundbreaking. A dream play, he tries to recreate what it's like to have a dream. And if it's done well, it's kind of successful. He spoke of the need to have new bottles to hold the new wine of modern plays. Which meant he felt that the old format of plays wasn't just wasn't good enough for him. So, again, this desire to break through the boundaries, to do something different. This is something you will see in a lot of people these days, uh, all around the world. Now, Anton Chekhov. I mean, boring beard. But it's a goatee, which is not necessarily common at the time. Chekhov. Not to be mistaken with Pavel Chekhov, who was on the Starship Enterprise, uh, only lived to be about 44. He was a Russian country doctor. He lived and worked in the time of plague throughout uh, Russia, and he basically worked without pay for quite a while. Uh, he made... Uh, his, fa his father went bankrupt, because, you know, if you want to be successful, you don't need a rich daddy, or so it seems. Maybe we do, we'll see in a minute. But as an artist, if you've got decent, any kind of an education, you possibly have a chance to break through. One of the things, and this drives on boxers, professional soccer players, and a lot of people, the, the memory of poverty will often inspire people to work until they make money doing what they feel they should be doing. Uh, people who grow up rich seldom are uh, represented on the football fields as much as those who grew up in poverty and had nothing else to do and no other way of getting out. This guy wrote popular short stories. He's still considered one of the greatest short story writers of all time. He wrote them for most of his career from maybe 
the 18, late 1870s through to nearly his death. Mostly comics, short stories, but oftentimes there were uh, representations of real life. He was so successful at this, he was able to afford to be a doctor for free and live off his uh, short stories. Of course, he only was able to do that when first he had used all his doctoring money in order to pay for his listless and feckless family, uh, who their father went bankrupt. He had 15, uh, 14 brothers and sisters. He supported most of them as a doctor, and he wrote the short stories so he had money for himself. He wrote a few short comic plays like The Bear and uh, The Proposal, and they were okay, they did, well, they did fine. Uh, his full-length plays didn't really take. It was, he'd written four full-length plays before that fourth one, two years after its miserable failure and pretty much the end of his career as a writer for theatre. Uh, that one was picked by a guy called Stanislavski, more about him shortly, for his Moscow Art Theatre because he felt this really captures who people are. After that was a success, he went on to write three more plays, Three Sisters. Uh, that play was The Seagull. He then went on to write Three Sisters, Uncle Vanya and Cherry Orchard, which are basically considered the, found the pillars of American drama. They don't say that here, but Chekhov is the most important of these three guys to the uh, average American audience, uh, the average American theatre professional. His plays were very realistic. People carrying on with life in spite of what is happening to them. So that's Chekhov. He's such an important character in American theatre. Not least because of who inspired him. And I'm going to run on quickly into who was the founder of modern dramatic performance, which is a grandiose term for some r Russian guy. This is Konstantin Stanislavski and his uh, system of rehearsal. You look at the picture, you know this guy is a different guy. No moustache no beard. He is not a writer. Anyway, he grew up in a rich family in Russia. He was a director and an actor. He didn't really write plays. He didn't actually, he also didn't write books. That is wrong and I need to change that. Hopefully I'll change that before I put this out. Um, he founded the Moscow Art Theatre because he had the money and the space to do this kind of thing. If he was poor, he was busy trying to do something that would earn him money. Uh, he founded it to explore his theatrical ideas because what he wanted to do was basically to try and redevelop uh, an idea of theatre that matched what was going on. So all these writers like Ibsen, Chekhov and Strindberg, they were writing plays that utilised the ideas of psychology. The plays, however, were not, which was, to him, odd and anathema. So... What he did was he started trying to work on these ideas. He didn't. He wrote several articles about his ideas, and they've been translated in varying degrees of success. The ideas about what is the best way to perform, and he moves over two things. In America, we've tended to go with just the one idea. His ideas uh, were basically divided into two parts: the dramatic system. Where, uh, which is an internal mental system and the physical method, not to be mistaken with method acting, which is where you use your body to help you. So with the system, it's a case of careful reading of the play, looking for the objectives, what the character wants, the motivations, what the character's reasons are for doing things. And that can go down as little as, why does he cross the room? And then his major one, now I'd say if you want to go into acting, this is the one that you probably need to be thinking of most of from these three, is the magic if. What would you do if you were in the same situation as the character? What would be the way you would approach the issue? The physical method is more along the lines that there is a physical side to everything as well. And it is necessary. Now, he looked at the way that the physical body's influence could influence the emotion not the other way around and a huge inf emphasis on reacting which is my favorite kind of acting is most behavior is in reaction to something that's happened not uh, and very few of us actually instigate stuff i'm going to focus on the second part of the physical method though because it's really important it's not just that the action influences the emotion we have lived our lives to this point whatever age we are and i know that sounds tautological because it is 
but we've done all these things. And when we have feel, felt sad, we have physically behaved in a certain way. Today, we'd call this idea muscle memory, that getting into a specific kind of situation, getting into a specific physical shape will influence how we are feeling, how we are thinking. Does that make sense? I hope it does. If it doesn't, please tell us. So if you're angry, tensing up is a thing we do when we're angry. So if you want to try and create that emotion within you to say the words, tense up like you would be uh, angry. And that will find, you, that physical uh, movement will change how you speak and will also uh, connect you with the emotion that your muscles recognize that as. So that kind of covers a little bit of the precursors. The next day, I'm gonna talk about a lot of the more modern variations on it. We're gonna talk about Lorraine Hansberry again because she does crop up for very good reasons. We're gonna talk about the method form of acting, which is derivative of Stanislavski, but builds on it in different ways. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, also August Wilson, and we're gonna talk about Lynn Nottage, and to a little degree, Tyler Perry and how they impact. But look for me too, treasures hidden within. Tell me the answer to my question. Give me that hashtag back if you like. And ask me questions. If you got questions, don't be shy. There should be another video published, hopefully at worst on Tuesday. Maybe before that, we'll have to see how much space the boy lets me have. And then, fingers crossed, um, I'll be on on Wednesday between 10.30 and 12 to chat with you about anything and everything. Hope uh, all is well. Stay well. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.